Welcome back to another episode of Watch This Shit. And today we're going to be talking about the 1992 classic Juice, which is fantastic, man. I had no idea. I I had there's a whole block of movies that I had kind of written off as modern black exploitation. Uh -huh. And if I'm going to watch black exploitation, I'd rather watch Shaft or Dolomite right, or right. The Black Godfather, any of those. Um, right. And this is not that. And apparently the uh, the director, writer director. Um, Used to work alongside big, Spike Lee. Big fan of horror movies. Lit my two favorite Spike Lee movies. Mm -hmm. uh, Do the Right Thing and Malcolm X. Right. Like, I could right. tell how well it was shot. And you get that when you have a director of photography who moves over to directing. Right. Like, his eye is on the light, and his eye is on the look, and his eye is on it. And it shows all that low lighting stuff that, you know, like them in the alley before they run into the store and them right. in like the, what is that, a uh, abandoned building after? After. Yeah. Spoiler alert. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. We're, we're going to spoil the movie. It's, it's going to happen. I was looking for the, the, the movies he did after this, um, Surviving the Game. Yes. Oh. Oh, I loved Surviving the Game when I was a fucking. Really? The year it came out, man. <laughs> I don't know why, but I. Also, directed one of my favorite 90s horror movies. I know what you did last summer. Tales from the Crypt presents The Demon Knight. Yes. Gone on to do some of the best television of, of the last probably 10 years. He worked, uh, I believe he did a lot of episodes of The Wire. Okay. Whoa. He did uh, a few episodes of Walking Dead. Really? A few episodes. Well, he's a huge horror fan. Oh, well, a few episodes of Weeds. A few episodes of. Uh, yes. He did an episode of Dexter. Dexter. Um, yeah, Dexter. Yeah. Eureka? Not a lot of people liked Eureka, I don't that think. That was a good show. This is so much better than Boys. Yeah. yeah. Um, message! It's a great, great, great crime story. It goes up on the shelf with anything Elmore Leonard has done, and that's my pinnacle for crime noir. Th there's a throw... It's almost a throwaway scene at mm -hmm. first where um, Rakim... Rahim. Rahim. Yeah. Raheem and his uh, baby's mama mm -hmm. are yelling at each other. And I didn't think much of it when I saw it. I was like, is that racist? I feel like that's kind of racist. <laughs> you know? It's like a, a breakdown by numbers. Like, if you have a group of guys, one of them is going to have a kid, even though they're in high school. Mm -hmm. One of them's going to be fat. One of them's going to be uh, uh, the one that has some sort of talent. And then, of course, there's the pretty boy who's probably knocked the chick out. I understood everything about that clip except for, for Tupac's character. And there's the scene, and again, this is the character development stuff You know, tw uh, before you hit the 22-minute mark, where um, he walks in and his dad doesn't say anything. Right. And, like, that's really the only character development you get from that guy, and it's never explained why he's such a colossal ass. But the entire movie, he is a colossal ass, and he treats his friends like shit. And if, you know, that guy who treats me like shit and is picking fights with me at my buddy's apartment is like, it's ride or die time, we're gonna go rob a store, I'm like... He's spoiled because he lives with his grandmother, who gives him everything because he didn't have his father in his life for a large portion of it because okay. his father was locked away. That's why uh, Rodamez was making fun of him, talking about how his dad was a bitch in the prison yard, mm -hmm. which is probably why he's just sitting there all quiet now because he had his manhood taken. Mm -hmm. And his mother's nowhere around. So he basically just gets his way. But in that environment, you know, the one with the most respect or juice is the toughest. So now he feels like he has to portray that mm -hmm. as loudly as he can, basically just a child screaming out. But I mean, you know, I suppose there's some virtue to having to be implied, but like when he finally does snap, I'm like, why? And being from that environment, I know what his deal was. Which is? He's a bitch. And I know that's going to be very unpopular to most people who are big Tupac fans. Mm -hmm. For years I've watched this movie saying there's some reason that I did not like Tupac's character. And anybody else you hear, Tupac this, Tupac that, even pertaining to this movie. But if you take Tupac out of it and put any other person into this role in this movie, you walk away feeling this guy's a bitch from the front to the back. The one thing that I did like about Tupac, he hmm. had this one gangster line where uh, him and Q were going back and forth at it. He's like, you saying I ain't shit? 
And Tupac looked at him, got right in his face and said, I tell your mama you ain't shit. Mm. First of all, two things that are instantaneously going to start a fight. Okay. Any mention of a, an African-American male's mother. All right. And uh, actually there are two more things. One is what's called an invitation to a person's penis. The other is when a person in the midst of an argument turns his back on you. Pardon Basically. my back, I remember that. Exactly, pardon my back. <laughs> that's, that's, and then next thing you know, don't turn your back on me and they fight. But when he said, I tell your mama you ain't shit, I would never say that. So there was they, a scene where the police chased him out of the arcade, uh -huh. and of course, Steele and his stupid behind, he's stuck there playing Street Fighter 1, and then he gets taken into the high school, and he gets chased out by the security guard. That's why there were characters I didn't recognize in the video game. Because <laughs> it's Street Fighter 1. <laughs> so crime doesn't pay. I kept thinking that during this movie, like, they're all hyped up about jacking this local convenience store, right? And I suppose if everything had gone down and they had been able to do more jobs, but they couldn't have gotten the cost of the gun out of the till, do you think? Here's what I don't understand. You're cute. You walk into the store, you see your boy Blizzard who just got out, mm -hmm. and he's about to rob the store. That was a great scene. You then go to Steele's house after the movie's over, the news flash is that this ass was just killed. Mm -hmm. You're fighting in Steele's house, breaking up his mama's vases and stuff, and stuff uh, because you're arguing over, oh, well, if we would have been there, he wouldn't have got killed. No, if we would have been there, then it would have been five dead niggas instead mm -hmm. of one. Okay, so we have logic. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, yeah, we're going to rob Quillez's store. Oh, Quillez isn't going to shoot anybody if he knows they got a gun. Says who? When the cops come into the DJ competition and Tupac still running his mouth, Raheem's dead. Like, man, shut up. Just mm -hmm. shut up. Keep your mouth shut. The one thing that I found peculiar was they've all been best friends for years. Mm -hmm. And then at uh, what I'm guessing would be the repass after the funeral when everybody's back at uh, Raheem's house, Raheem's mother knows Steel and Q, but then Bishop has to, has to reminded, come up yeah. and introduce himself like, do you remember me? And I'm like, how are you one of the crew and you gotta reintroduce yourself to his mama? I loved that scene, two reasons. Mm -hmm. The first one, um, she says, Mama hasn't cried yet. Right. And then Tupac comes in, and he's such a sweetheart. And he finally gets Mom to cry. Mom right. cries a little bit when Tupac talks to her. And I, I thought that was, it wasn't, they didn't beat you over the head with it. Mm -hmm. But it was a very, like, subtle way of showing how, what a master manipulator yeah. Bishop is. And then the other thing um, was the baby mama. Because it was such a throwaway thing that I had forgotten about it. Mm -hmm. Until mm -hmm. you get to the funeral, and it's like, oh, shit. Yeah, he's got a kid. The story itself, it gets cooking. I mean, like, you you spend 22 minutes getting to like these guys. Mm -hmm. And you do like them, except right. for Tupac. And then the story um, starts with the robbery. It's 22 minutes in. And it cooks all the way. And it, and it cooks hard, and it keeps you engaged. And, it, and it's cool, and it's interesting. And about 1.15, I'm like, oh, God. Is this still happening? He threw that gun out. And um, I was like, you are the dumbest motherfucker. You don't, at that point, I didn't feel like he deserved to survive the movie. Honestly, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. I agree with you wholeheartedly. The only person who thought that was a good plan was MacGyver. Okay. Him and Batman. Q, MacGyver, and Batman are the only people who thought that was a good idea. Uh, another really gangster scene. So it was two for Tupac. Oh, okay. I tell you, mama, you ain't shit. Mm -hmm. And then when they were in the elevator together, mm -hmm. and Q looked at him and said, what? You gonna shoot me here in the elevator? And then he sure enough cocked that bitch and shot mm -hmm. at him right there in the elevator. Mm -hmm. He's super gangster. Mm -hmm. And then once everybody runs off the elevator and Q knocks the gun out of his hand, now all of a sudden he's running away from Q. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want any parts of that ass whooping. The only thing I don't like about this movie is the ending. There's a beautiful bit of foreshadowing Mm -hmm. that they do to and it's like it's so blatant that when i saw it like i was like foreshadowing um where he's watching uh 
white heat or whatever where the guy's burning down the the right. the gin still and he's like I'm on top of the world ma right and like he's gonna go out in a blaze of glory and he gets really Tupac gets really excited about that and I was like foreshadowing right he's gonna go out in a blaze of glory and he, and he says it so and again foreshadowing they're building you up to this really big uh, climax where Tupac's gonna take control of his own fate and then, and so what was supposed to happen and what they shot mm -hmm. was he lets go mm -hmm. he's like fuck this shit drops to his death okay takes charge of his own destiny they pay off foreshadowing it's a bigger ending to the movie with a with a louder message you know if i can't have the juice i don't even want to be around right like it's so much better than what they did and uh, they showed it to test audiences people universally were bummed out by that because mm. it's a bummer right mm -hmm. fair enough you know but it needed to happen because mm -hmm. the entire rest of the story builds it up to that. Right. And then when it doesn't happen, and he slips and cries like a bitch, don't let go of me! Right. You're like, oh, and man. He, but he stays true to his character because he's been a bitch the whole movie. That's true. He, yeah. So he ended on the same note he started off on. He lived like a bitch and he <laughs> died, died like, like a, a bitch. bitch. <laughs> He did do that. Emphasis on the word bitch. This movie back then is on VHS, and so it's in the house, and I have DJ equipment. So. <laughs> but I was nowhere near as, as good. Do you know who that really was doing that? No. Because it couldn't have been Omar oh, Epps. No, I mean, no, no, no. It was there's, there's, a, there's a reason he wears like a hoodie. Right. When he does that shit. I mean, I, if I had to guess, I'd say DJ Scratch, just because okay. he was a really good DJ back in the day. But don't quote me on that. We're talking about Tupac's acting, um, and he does he does better than Epps. And and I don't yeah. I don't like Epps. This is the best Michael or Omar Epps performance I believe that I've I've seen. I found this one the least irritating, the most honest, mm -hmm. um, and I think it's telling that it's his first performance. And he's been in he's been in good movies. Um, the program, yes, is one of my favorite sports movies. I don't really care for the sports <laughs> movies. The underdog wins. I spoiled every sports movie <laughs> you've ever fucking seen in your entire life. Willie Mays Hayes. They don't uh, Willie Mays Hayes. And no, that was uh, part two. Yes, part two. Major League uh, Two. Because uh, Wesley Snipes was in it to me is uh -huh. Willie Mays Hayes. Okay, Wesley Snipes. But oh yeah, Q didn't Q have the baby. Q didn't have the yeah. baby. <laughs> that was just way better. He had the <laughs> bad chick from In Vogue as his girlfriend. Who was and a remember, doctor or a nurse? No, she was a nurse. nurse but but you got to remember, he's like 16, 17 yeah. years old, and he's got a nurse mm -hmm. who's letting him come over. He's smashing it during the day. She's cooking him dinner, rubbing rubbing him in her husband's ex husband's oh, face. Oh, that was so gangster. Yeah. Well, actually, Q was short for Quincy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What happened to names like Mustafa? Were they too hard to spell? So Tupac, not his first big screen appearance. No. You know what it was? Do not. Nothing but trouble. Right. I'm trying to remember the song. I know Digital Underground actually had a song on the soundtrack. Well, and Dan Aykroyd's character gets up and like shreds the organ. Right. I th no, he did. He did. He, he actually he said yeah. that part. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Fox, a singer, a rapper, an actor. I mean, he went to what, school what, for performing arts what with can Jada the man Pinkett. Not do so. The second movie that I've ever watched with Tupac in it. Okay. Uh, the first, which I have here somewhere, uh, Gridlocked. That was the first movie you saw with. Which I okay. saw in the '90s, probably the year it came out on on VHS. I, I went and rented, and, and I was a huge Tim Roth fan. Right. That was why I picked it up, and I really liked him in that, and I really liked him in this. Um, he beat out. And I, I'm not sure how to say this. If you know, please correct me. Donald Fazian. 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 Right. Turk. From Scrubs. Yes. Yeah, when, matter of fact, the scene you were referencing, uh, <clears throat> what you call it, when Q was at his locker, the light-skinned guy with the high-top fade, when Q was having trouble getting into his locker, and he was like, damn, it's been that long? Uh-huh, yeah. That was Donald Faison. Two scenes in the movie I don't buy. One of them totally not his fault, and we'll get to that. Okay. The other one, um, where he's trying to convince, he's trying to set up uh, Q with, with Sammy J. And... Mm -hmm. It was something that was like he could embody the character, 
and be the character, but right. he couldn't be the character being somebody else. Right. You know, which... No, 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 I totally understand. You are a barber, yes? Yes. Hairstylist, barber, what do you, what do you prefer? Uh, barber. Barber? Yes. Is that the man version? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, um, and I am a barber two box at hair. University Barbershop. That, you know, that what actually came... First of all, that actually came up when I was watching the movie. Okay. Because I remember when we were watching Boys in the Hood, I, mm-hmm. I pointed out how whack the haircuts were. Yeah. The haircuts were definitely better in this movie. It was a thing about individuality. Okay. Like, like Donald Faison, he had the box fade. Mm-hmm. That was popular. But then you have kids who want to express themselves and be individuals, so everybody had their own slant on it. Mm -hmm. Some would have uh, half a box where it was slanted to one direction or the other direction, or instead of having it slanted and perfect, you might have it rounded off and then it was the Gumby. It reminded me of, you know, you're playing Mario, and like there are those hills in the background, like those little green hills. (laughs) One's always a little bit bigger than the other one. All right, so that was Juice, the 1992 classic crime noir. I say watch this shit because it's fucking amazing. It's insanely well lit, insanely well acted, an incredibly cool story, fucking uh, master fucking director. There's nothing not to like about it except for the ending, which the rest of it's so good that you kind of you can you can forgive the last 12 minutes of the movie. Right. Uh, I'm an African American male that really? grew up in the hood of New York. Uh, during this time period, a lot of it the rang Bunny true. Right. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of it, a lot of the movie rang true to me. There was some good acting done. Uh, I definitely give this a watch. This shit, it is one of my favorite movies, and I've watched it a few times. So, watch this shit. <laughs> I can go back to my life in Squaresville any time, baby.